Hello adventurer, and welcome to the Skyrim Book Club, the on-the-go solution for the busy adventure in Tamriel's coldest, far-reaching province. Let us collect the literature and lore of this great province for you and put it into a portable package so that you never have to stop fighting dragons, picking flowers, or stealing from shopkeepers when they aren't looking. With an ever-increasing archive, SkyrimBookClub.ca has got the story for you. Until next time, enjoy the book. The Madness of Pelagius by Sathenes, profiling the renowned Mad Emperor. The man who would be the emperor of all of Tamriel was born Thoris Pelagius Septum, a prince of the royal family of Wayrest in Third Era 119 at the end of the glorious reign of his uncle, Antiochus I. Now, Wayrest had been showered by much preference during the years before Pelagius' birth, for King Magnus was Antiochus' favorite brother. It's hard to say when Pelagius' madness first manifested itself, for in truth, the first ten years of his life were marked by much insanity in the land itself. When Pelagius was just over a year old, Antiochus died, and a daughter, Kintyra, assumed the throne to the acclaim of all. Kintyra II was Pelagius' cousin, and an accomplished mystic and sorceress. Although if she'd had sufficient means to peer into the future, she probably would have fled the palace. The story of the War of the Red Diamond has been told in many other scholarly journals. But as most historians agree, Kintaria II's reign was usurped by her and Pelagius' cousin Uriel, by the power of his mother, Putema, the so-called Wolf Queen of Solitude. The year after her coronation, Kintaira was trapped in Glenpoint and imprisoned in the Imperial dungeons there. Now all of Tamriel exploded into warfare as Prince Uriel took the throne as Uriel III and High Rock, because of the imprisoned Empress's presence there, was the location of some of the bloodiest battles. Pelagius' father, King Magnus, allied himself with his brother Sephiroth against the usurper Emperor and brought the wrath of Uriel III and Queen Potema down on Wayrest. Pelagius, his brothers and sisters, and his mother Uthalia fled to the Isle of Balfiera. Uthalia was of the House of Dyrene, and her family manse is still located on that ancient isle even to this day. There is thankfully much written record of Pelagius' childhood in Balfiera, recorded by nurses and visitors. All who met him described him as a handsome, personable boy, interested in sports, magic, and music. Now even assuming a diplomat's lack of candor, Pelagius seemed, if anything, a blessing to the future of the Septim dynasty. When Pelagius was eight, Sephiroth slew Uriel III at the Battle of Ichidig and proclaimed himself Emperor Sephiroth I. For the next ten years of his reign, Sephiroth battled Potema. Pelagius' first battle was the Siege of Solitude, which ended with Potema's death and the final end of the war. In gratitude, Sephiroth placed Pelagius on the throne of Solitude. Now as the King of Solitude, Pelagius' eccentricities of behavior began to be noticeable. As a favorite nephew of the Emperor, a few diplomats to Solitude made critical commentaries about Pelagius. For the first two years of his reign, Pelagius was at the very least noted for his alarming shifts in weight. Four months after taking the throne, a diplomat from Ebenhardt called Pelagius a hale and hearty soul, with a heart so big it widens his waist. Five months after that, the visiting princess of first hold wrote to her brother that the king gripped my hand and it felt like I was being clutched by a skeleton. Pelagius is greatly emaciated indeed. Sephiroth never married and died childless three years after the Siege of Solitude. As the only surviving sibling, Pelagius' father Magnus left the throne of Wayrest and took residence at the imperial city as the Emperor Magnus I. Magnus was elderly, and Pelagius was his oldest living child, so the attention of Tamriel naturally focused on Sentinel. By this time, Pelagius' eccentricities were becoming infamous. There are many legends about his acts as king of Sentinel, but few well-documented cases exist. It is known that Pelagius locked the young princes and princesses of Sylvanar in his room with him, only releasing them when an unsigned declaration of war was slipped under the door. When he tore off his clothes during his speech he was giving at a local festival, his advisors apparently decided to watch him a little more carefully. On the orders of Magnus, Pelagius was married to the beautiful heiress of an ancient dark elf noble family, Kataria Reathim. Now, Nordic kings who marry dark elves seldom improve their popularity. There are two reasons most scholars give for this union. First, Magnus was trying to cement relations with Ebenhard, where the Reathim clan hailed. 
Ebenhardt's neighbor, Mornhold, had been an historical ally of the Empire since the very beginning, and the royal consort of Queen Berenzia had won many battles in the War of the Red Diamond. Ebenhardt had a poorly kept secret of aiding Uriel III in Potema. The second reason for the marriage was more personal. Kateria was as shrewd a diplomat as she was beautiful. Now, if any person was capable of hiding Pelagius' madness, it was she. On the 8th of 2nd Seed, 3rd Era 145, Magnus I died quietly in his sleep. Jolith, Pelagius' sister, took over the throne of Solitude, and Pelagius and Kateria rode to the imperial city to be crowned Emperor and Empress of Tamriel. It is said that Pelagius fainted when the crown was placed on his head, but Kataria held him up so only those closest to the throne could see what had truly happened. Like so many Pelagius stories, this cannot be independently verified. Pelagius III never truly ruled Tamriel. Kataria and the Elder Council made all of the decisions and only tried to keep Pelagius from embarrassing them all. Still, Stories of Pelagius III's reign do exist. It was said that when the Argonian ambassador from Black Rose came to court, Pelagius insisted on speaking in all grunts and squeaks, as that was the Argonian's natural language. It is known that Pelagius was obsessed with cleanliness, and many guests have reported waking to the noise of an early morning scrubdown of the imperial palace. The legend of Pelagius, while inspecting the servant's work, suddenly defecating on the floor to give them something to do, is probably apocryphal. When Pelagius began actually biting and attacking visitors to the imperial palace, it was decided to send him to a private asylum. Kateria was proclaimed regent two years after Pelagius took the throne. For the next six years, the emperor stayed in a series of institutions and asylums. Traitors to the emperor have many lies to spread about this period of our history. Whispered stories of hideous experiments and tortures performed on Pelagius have almost become accepted as fact. The noble lady Kateria became pregnant shortly after the emperor was sent away, and rumors of infidelity, and even more absurd, conspiracies to keep the sane emperor locked away, ran amok. As Kateria proved, her pregnancy came about after a visit to her husband's cell. With no other evidence... As loyal subjects, we are bound to accept the Empress's word on this matter. Her second child, who had reigned for many years as Uriel IV, was the child of her union with her consort, Lariate, and was publicly acknowledged as such. On a warm night in sun's dawn, in his 34th year, Pelagius III died after a brief fever in his cell at the Temple of Kynareth in the Isle of Bethany. Kataria I reigned for another 46 years, before passing the scepter onto the only child she had had with Pelagius, Cassinder. Pelagius's wild behavior has made him perversely dear to the province of his birth and death. The second of Sun's Dawn, which may or may not be the anniversary of his death, is celebrated as Mad Pelagius Day, a time when foolishness of all sorts is encouraged. And so, one of the least desirable emperors in the history of the Septim dynasty has in fact become one of the most famous ones.